Good evening. Thank you for joining me this evening for a Bible study together. As you get your Bibles out, get them ready. Actually, go ahead and go turn to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. I want us to read this passage together in Jonah chapter 1 and verses 1 through 4 to start us off in our study tonight. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, as I look at this uh, passage, I'm always reminded of really the word no, the word no. And this topic came to my mind again the other day as now we are, uh, Kenji and I are three children in, and with each child, one of the great similarities that each of them have had is that word no. N O. And they learn that pretty early in life, don't they? And as parents, how does that usually make us feel when we tell our children to do something and they say no? Well, our youngest, of course, Emily, she'll be turning two in July this year, and she has learned that word no. And, you know, let's go do this. No, you know, no. And so, Understanding they learn that word, they give the head, the head shake no as well. They, they, they pick up on those things, don't they? Well, we understand this to a certain degree, that we don't like to be told no. Interesting thing is, our child is doing exactly as we did when we were their age, and we were actually telling our parents the same thing, no. And... Dwelling on this thought of saying no and how it makes me feel, I, I thought as one who has created, who has been created by God, how many times I have told the Lord no and how it must have made him feel. And again, as we started out there in John in chapter 1, that's really what we see. One of the biblical characters that we many times think of who, who told God no. Now, I know that we don't actually find the word N-O there or Jonah just verbally saying, no, I'm not going uh, to Nineveh. I know we don't see that particular statement in the scripture there, but it was by his very actions that he was telling God no. No to what the Lord had told him to do. Now, it really takes some thought and deep, deep examination uh, in our lives because on the surface, we don't like to think that we tell God no, uh, our creator, our sustainer of life, that we would tell such powerful God who created all things and sustains life, our Father, that we would tell him no. Yet, if we are really honest with ourselves, we do say no to God. And that's what I want us to consider in this study tonight of I said no to God. I said no to God. Now, I always thought it to be interesting that we emphasize how we feel when we are told no. We always will emphasize that, you know, of how it made us feel, our emotions. But what about God? How does God feel when we tell him no? Maybe not verbally saying no, but by our actions saying no. So, demonstrating no. So, according to the scriptures, now I want us to look at uh, several scriptures together uh, this evening of, of what it means to, I said no to God. I think about that little kid there on the, on the picture there. <laughs> uh, I've seen that a couple times in my life. Um, maybe actually looking back at myself a little bit when I was a kid. But anyways, I think that does represent uh, much of our attitudes a lot of times. But if you go to the scriptures, we find that God does have emotions. You know, God is described as being able to feel wrath. He's able to feel anger, as Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. Read with me there. Prove all things according to his word, not mine. 
Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience, and in them you also once walked when you were living in them. Think about that. There, there's the word wrath there, okay? For it is because of these things that the wrath of God, okay? So again, he can feel wrath and anger due to our actions. Also, God is described as being able to feel sorrowful. Well, we know this in Genesis chapter 6 when the Lord uh, was condemning the actions of, of uh, mankind, of what was uh, just sinful thoughts continuously. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved where? In his heart. Or if you look at 1 Samuel 15, 10 and 11, the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret that I have made Saul king for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. So he's able to feel sorrowful. And again, these are just a few examples just to prove the point that needs to be made about how God does experience emotions. Zephaniah 3 and verse 17, the Lord your God is in your midst a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. So on the opposite end of the spectrum here, that the Lord not only feels wrath or anger or sorrow, uh, but he's also able to feel joy. As it goes on to say, he'll be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. Or another passage, Isaiah 62 and verse 5. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. You know, and again, these are just a few passages that we could just bring up here. And I believe that we can deduce uh, from what we see here in the scriptures that what we do, our actions truly do affect the very heart of God. I want us to really think about that, okay? When our child acts up, and, and as parents, uh, you know, even those uh, who have been parents for many, many years, and it may, maybe even grandparents now, but you look back on those times, and you think about your children, when they acted up, and when your child said no, I'll never forget the first time I ever heard that come out of my child's mouth, and they don't do what we tell them to do, or when our child says no, however, goes about doing the task reluctantly, you know, it affects our hearts, doesn't it? I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. It affects our hearts. We get upset, don't we? We, we, we experience, we uh, have anger, we have wrath, we have sorrow. Um, we know these emotions all too well, don't we? But again, let, let's think about how we are affecting our creator, God's heart today in our lives. Are we saying no? And I mean, I mean, just outright no, or even going about our lives doing things for God reluctantly with an attitude of no. Uh, as a father, I loved my child first. God, as my father, loved me first. 1 John 4 and verse 19 tells us this. My child is subject to me, and I am subject to God. God owes me nothing. He owes me nothing. I want you to really think about that. The Apostle Paul would say to those on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17 and verse 28, For in him, for in the Lord, we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. God is the sustainer of our lives. He loves us. He has demonstrated that love by giving his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die you have heard this verse many times on the passages of Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. I've quoted many times from the pulpit that when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, there are many who claim Jesus as a Savior, however, don't like to think him, think of him as Lord, don't like to think of him as King, don't like to think of him as Master. No one would dare to say that I would tell God or Jesus in what is commanded of my life, no. But the fact is, friends, we do. 
more times than we would like to acknowledge and recognize in our lives. So this evening in this study, I just want us to consider briefly how, how, how is it that we are saying no to God today? Well, one of the things we're even studying in our Wednesday night Bible classes is about God what he desires of us and, and what he wants is that of commitment isn't it i think that is very clear through numerous passages of the of the scriptures because even when we think about god and, and that really he again being the creator and the sustainer of all things that Truly, he has every right to expect that we are committed to him. I mean, again, we, we don't have to go very far, obviously, right there in the first uh, book of the Bible in Genesis 1 and verse 1, that yes, it was in the beginning that God created. He created the heavens and the earth. All that we see around us is created by him. And we, as verses 26 and 27 points out, that we were made in his image. That's what it says very plainly there. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. All things were created for him, by him. Did you notice that even in the New Testament passage of Colossians chapter 1 and verses 16 and 17, that for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and, look at this, for him, for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. Friends, I, we can't escape these facts. These facts is God, the very creator, the owner of all that exists of this world. Even as a psalmist declares, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains the world and those who dwell in it. Psalm 24 verse 1. Even chapter 89 in verse 11, the heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all it contains, you have founded them. Friends, that's the point that Paul was driving home as we noted in Acts chapter 17 just a moment ago. He goes on what he said prior to that of verse 28 that we just read. He said in verse 24 on down to that verse, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist and have our very being. I want you to think about that with me. Not only are we created by God, as, as again pointed out so uh, plainly here, and as the psalmist would even say how we are fearfully and wonderfully we are made, but especially as Christians who have been born again, as we see in John 3 and verse 3, what they, tells us that we are born again. That's what Jesus was wanting, desiring, that we are born again. We've been baptized, buried with Christ in baptism to rise and walk in newness of life as commanded. A child of God, we were bought with the blood of Jesus Christ and that, friends, we are not our own. We're not our own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Glorify God. It belongs to God. Friends, much more than understanding we've been by that very blood. We've been justified by that very blood of Christ. That means we have been crucified. The old man and we put on the new man. 
we have a different perspective. We have a different value system that is according to God. We treasure the things of God. We treasure them, don't we? Or we should. And the things this temporary world we lose, we let go. However, this is where the word no comes in. This is where even Christians are found saying no to God. And, and again, it may be an outright no. It may be blatant in God's face. Or it could also be done in a whiny little voice. No, as one reluctantly does what God said to do. Either or it shows that one is not devoted, not committed to the cause of Christ. And we have to understand, Jesus is not looking for a corner of our heart to sit in. He wants the whole thing. Jesus doesn't want one who is trying to hold on to the world and trying to hold on to him because it's not going to work out, as Jesus said himself, that no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Matthew 6, verse 24. Because what, is, what, what goes on in this is, is, as Paul would say, about our bodies being a living sacrifice. It's about being holy and accepted to God. That is our reasonable service. And again, that's very plainly pointed out there in Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. That we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're not to be conformed to this world. But as Paul said, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind to prove what is good and acceptable, the perfect will of God. So if I'm conforming to the world's ways, then such is not a committed disciple of Christ. Because Romans 12 tells us we have to renew our minds by transformation rather than conforming to this world. Friends, it, this always reminds me of a story that a man by the name of Stuart Kennedy told regarding an explorer who brought back a, a chameleon, uh, which his household affectionately named Billy the Lizard. And the explorer, uh, had, the explorer had left Billy the Lizard in uh, the charge of his butler, who showed him his many friends and associates. Uh, but when the explorer returned, he asked how Billy was. And the butler said, well, sir, it was like this. We put Billy on the green rug, he turned green as Ireland. We put him on the red rug, he turned as red as Russia. Then someone put him on a patchwork quilt and poor Billy burst into a million pieces. Kenny said, the world we live in is a patchwork quilt, a bewildering complex, patched with the colors of the rainbow. And we madly try to adapt ourselves to its complexities. We change our characters according to the company we keep. And because we choose to be this way, we cannot commit to anything. What a truth that illustration brings out. That's a truth. There are too many that want to change the characters and adapt to the complexities of the world. Yet Jesus is there wanting those who are determined, devoted, committed to his cause. And anyone can wear the name Christian. And there are many today who do just that. Staking the claim of a believer, but there's no fruit, there's no works. Only one who likes to wear a cross rather than bear the cross. And according to James, faith without works is dead. You know, Scripture many times is Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. And again, in our Wednesday evening Bible class, we've been talking about salvation church, salvation commitment church. And, and we noticed Luke chapter 9, 23 and 24, that Jesus was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. That's what Paul was all about. He was about losing himself with Christ. He, conf he, he, he confessed that he had crucified 
himself with Christ. Galatians 2 and verse 20. He said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Friends, what we find today so many times is many who are like Billy the Lizard on the patchwork quilt of the world who's with lives that are just falling apart. They're falling apart, bursting into pieces, not committed to anything. And I, and I just ask, are we really committed and faithful to the cause of Christ? Have we committed ourselves to the Lord or are we really saying no to God today? Have we taken a moment to consider our commitment to God as a faithful disciple of His? Because if we stop and we really take an honest evaluation and inspect our lives accordingly, God requires of us to glorify Him through our lives by the things that we do. And when you consider Jesus and the life that He lived every day, His life was all about His Father. To bring glory, praise, honor to his Father. And when you go and study the miracles that Jesus performed, you would find the people glorifying God. That's what you would find. In Matthew 15, verse 31, the crowd marveled as they saw the mute speaking, the crippled restored, the lame walking, and the blind saying, and what did they do? They glorified the God of Israel. That's what they were doing. Another example of this is in Luke chapter 5, verses 25 and 26. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. That's what he was doing, verse 26. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. In our daily lives, going about our daily activities, we as disciples of Christ are instructed to glorify God. Many times it is believed that we are glorifying God by simply abstaining from doing wrong. Just by simply, well, we, we didn't commit, you know, we're, we're, com we're not committing sin. Well, there, there's, a, there's the idea of sin of commission and the sin of omission. There's more that goes into it, friends. This goes on to being disciples that are active in service. Not be being stale uh, spectators, but rather participators in the kingdom of our Lord. This means that we must be doing things that cause people to glorify God. Matthew 5 and verse 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Look what Peter says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 12. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, by your good works which they observe, Glorify God in the day of visitation. Christ is, see my disciples. No one is an island to themselves. What we do, our actions affect others and especially the perception of God. The Israelites of old were told to be completely committed to God. That's what they were told. To love him with all their heart, soul, and mind in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And if you read the bulletin this morning... Uh, you, you're going to find that, uh, that article about passing the torch and about the commands that they were giving there in Deuteronomy chapter 6. To live a life of obedience before others, doing good to show others of heathen nations who their God was. And yet we find the Israelites, they would forget God. They would mix and they would mingle with the heathen nations. And God would be mocked by the people of the heathen nations as God would deliver the Israelites to captivity for their rebellious actions because they said no to God. And there's many times we find in the scriptures that, that even the children of God in the days of old, what they would do, the Israelites would do, is they would go through the motions. They would have a checklist of things that they would do, but their heart was not there. They were not truly devoted. They would give the lame, they, they would give just the leftovers, the scraps of their time, their energy to God. And you see that in Malachi, and you go read Malachi, and you're going to find that. And what those people were doing is, even though they were going through the, 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 the motions of, of acting like they were serving God, they were just giving him the scraps and the leftovers and, and saying no. They were saying no to God. And God called them out for it. I want us to consider our lives. That's what I want us to do. And be serious. What people that see us and observe us, not as going through the motion and putting on a show. 
That's not. That's, that's the Pharisees. We know what was really going on there from, from our scriptures and reading those. But would people be able to say, this one says yes to God at every opportunity that it is presented. They say yes to God and they say no to the world. They love and serve and bring glory to God, even prompting them to glorify God through their service. Again, we cannot forget that we were bought with a price and that we are to glorify God. We are to glorify God, aren't we? Our body, our spirit, they belong to God. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. See, we cannot miss this. We cannot miss this. When people look at our lives, do they see a changed life that brings glory to God? Because again, Paul's life did just that. People would be able to look at Paul by the things that he said, by the things that he did, and they would know that Paul always said yes to God and no to the world. He said, I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but only they kept hearing. He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. Galatians 1, 22 through 24. They were glorifying God because of Paul. God wants us to be committed to his cause and do the good works to glorify him and bring lost souls to him. Christians are to be doing the work of their owner, their master. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. 1 John 2, 5 and 6. This does take, this does take it to another level, doesn't it? It does. Jesus commanded his followers to work his ministry until he returned. That's what he was telling them in the Great Commission in Matthew 28 and verses 18 through 20, when Jesus came up and spoke to his disciples saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There's so much that we can do to glorify God. But so many opportunities that come our way, we just say no. And I refer back to Jonah. Jonah did just that. God told him to go to Nineveh and to preach to those wicked Ninevites. Well, Jonah had different plans. And he said no to God by his actions. And many times when we really are honest with ourselves, we do just like Jonah did. We say no. We go another direction, and a direction that we like, an area that we are comfortable in, and we say no to what God would have us to be doing. Friends, I began this lesson by telling you the idea of where this came from, and that is my own children. All three of my children have done this. They have all said no. Stubborn at times, yet I love them, so I love them. My heart hurts. I get upset. I get frustrated. I get irritated. I get disappointed. I get sorrowful when I tell my children to do something, and they either say no verbally or no by not doing what I told them to do. And even when they do what I told them to do with a reluctant attitude, the disappointment is there. And I apply this to my life and I hope that you will apply it to yours. How often do we say no to God and how often do we really truly upset him, disappoint him? Friends, as we've seen from these scriptures, I think it is quite apparent that we are to be committed to him. This is not just some kind of half-hearted notion that we go through on, in the seasons of our lives. This is about commitment and devotion. About all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind. And we are to serve him. We are to serve our, 
our fellow Christians, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to encourage and to edify and be edified from them. And we are to reach out to a lost and dying world. We are to be a light as we see in Matthew chapter 5. And we are to be the salt of the earth. We are to glorify God through our good works toward others as we strive to live faithfully for His cause, obeying His will, and in turn show others, demonstrate even before them, teaching others even about this wonderful God that has done so much for us. You know, I relate this to when I've told my kids to do something and they say, yes, sir. Or I love to hear it when they tell their mother, yes, ma'am. And with a happy heart, they go and they accomplish the task and the responsibilities that they have. And they come back afterwards and say, dad or mom, I love you. You know, as a father, it fills my heart with joy just as it does Kenzie's. When we are faithful to the Lord God, when we are committed to his cause and we say yes and we go about our lives serving with a happy heart, diligent in service, we are saying, I love you, God. I love you and I'm thankful for all that you have done for me, for all that you are doing and all that you're going to do as we look to the promises of his word. I want to ask you this, this evening, are you saying yes to God? Are you saying yes to him? Are you saying no to the world as well? Are you committed to him, his cause, and going to do the work that he has called you to do with a happy heart? Or are you like the chameleon on the patchwork quilt of the world? And if you found yourself saying no to God, maybe you not put on the body of Christ in baptism. There's an opportunity for you to say yes to God. There's opportunity for you to start saying yes in your day-to-day -day lives, striving to bring Him glory, honor, and praise. And in turn, friends, influence others to say yes to God. Say yes. And that's what happened to Jonah. When Jonah finally started saying yes to God, he went and preached to the Ninevites. And you know, as he was commanded to do that, the Ninevites repented in sackcloth and ashes. Look at the results. God said yes to us in giving his only begotten son on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And God says yes to us in his promises. His promises that he gives to us. As we think about 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him. Amen to the glory of God through us. Say yes to God and claim the promises in him and to his glory through you today. If you are a disciple of Christ and you found yourself saying no to God, then there's opportunities for you as well to start saying yes to God. Stop saying no to God. To start saying yes to be his children, those who really love him, respect him, obey him with a happy heart. I hope that you will turn and do that. I hope you will. If one has not put on the body of Christ baptism again, whatever the case may be, I would certainly hope that you would reach out to me and that you would uh, let me know about your need. Please do that. Reach out to me at DJ at LaporteChurchOfChrist.com. I would love to get your message. I would love to hear from you and how I can serve you, how I can help you start saying yes to God and no to the world and encourage you each and every day to do just that. Thank you so much for tuning in and to study the Word of God with me. I hope that this lesson has served as a reminder to you as it has to me about my responsibilities to our Creator God who gave His only begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins. I would please ask for you to join us Sunday. I have not updated this chart because actually on Sunday, uh, coming up on May the 2nd, we are going to actually have our one service, one assembly. We have been dividing them up into different times uh, due to uh, the social distancing aspect and things, but uh, 
But please know that at 10 a.m. we're going to have our one assembly, and we look forward to that so much. There are reserved sections, uh, actually, as well. If you would like to have a reserved section to join us, we will accommodate you uh, to be able uh, for you to join us in this worship service, uh, that we will uh, be able to have you uh, in a section that's res that's uh, reserved and that has uh, the social distance requirements and those types of things. So please feel free to join us at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning coming up. Uh, also, there, the FM transmitter option is still available on the 10 a.m. service. There will be spots there for you to be able to be served um, uh, that morning. Uh, if you would choose to use the FM transmitter, uh, or if you're uh, shut in, you're not able to get out, you might be quarantining, whatever it may be, um, not able to get out for whatever reason, that service will be at 10 a.m. live streamed on our YouTube channel as well as our Facebook page. So all of these options are here at your disposal. We just ask you be our guest. And reach out to me. You can go to LaporteChurchOfChrist.com. Uh, that way you can uh, also find out more information about that, about our services and those types of things. Or there's also a contact form there that you can fill out and send in to us. But uh, LaporteChurchOfChrist.com. So thank you so much again for joining me in this Bible study. I hope it's been encouragement to you. And let's be encouragement to each other to continue to say yes to God and no to the world. Have a great rest of the day and a wonderful, wonderful week. And God bless.